FlexDuct works just fine when it's installed properly. Um, Neil Comparetto, who's one of my one of my buddies, does a lot of testing on duct leakage and on delivered performance as far as CFM output. And they install super high end uh, installations, a lot of low static um, ducted ductless systems, ducted mini splits uh, up in the Virginia market, and they test them a lot. And what they find is is that when you extend flex duct fully, so it doesn't, it's not compressed internally, meaning stretch tight, you're not making sharp 90s or really any bends or turns of any significance with the flex itself, and you're sealing it properly, it actually performs really well. The objection to it being that it doesn't last as long and it's not as durable, that's still a perfectly fine objection, but you know, get real, we're in Florida, nothing lasts very long here. You know, the houses are gonna be destroyed by a giant wrecking ball every 15 years. It's a new coat. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, really, it's termites, yeah, termites, take care of it. Um, so anyway, when we're running a flex duct, if you can think of it in terms of like a pipe with water flowing through it, I think this is a really good uh, analogy. Again, credit where credit's due, Michael Hausch always says this. When you think about a pipe with water running through it, if you make turns or bends in the pipe, what's the water gonna do inside the pipe? What's gonna happen? It's going to have turbulence, right? You're just going to create turbulence. So when you have fittings, when you have changes in size, when you have turns and curves, you're going to get turbulence inside a, a pipe. And both air and water are both a fluid, and so they behave in the same way. They both behave ac according to the laws of um, fluid dynamics. So when you're running a duct, if you do anything weird with it, or if you compress it so those ribs are impinging on the ductwork, it creates turbulence along the side. And that turbulence creates resistance to airflow. So what we want to do when we're installing a duct system, and it doesn't matter what material we're using, we want it to be as straight as possible. We want to reduce turbulence. When we make bends, we want them to be nice, gentle bends, right, where possible, or at least, at the very minimum, have minimal uh, impingement on the bend. If you imagine a, a piece of flex, and you take a piece of flex and you turn it on a 90, that internal corner there is very rough as those ribs kind of all come together, and so that creates a lot of turbulence. Um, but even if you were going to be running, you know, duckboard or uh, metal or whatever, you wouldn't want a bunch of turns and curves and that sort of thing. So it's just common sense. And so when we design a duct system or when we're installing a duct, for example, if you take a, you know, a duct off of the side of a plenum and you immediately curve it around in order to make it fit somewhere, that radius that you just made is going to create a lot of turbulence. So let's start there. What could you do instead? Let's say you have a really tight supply plenum in an attic, you know, it's coming right near the corner of the, of the roof, and you need to come out and make a quick 90. What would be another way of making that connection other than taking flex and attaching it to that, um, to that plenum? You could extend the box, that would be a way, sure. You could, you could, you know, radius around, sometimes we've done that where you can actually get the, get the actual plenum extended away, that's, that's a good way. What are some other things you could do? Yep, you could use a piece of snap lock 90. So you could take it now, again, a snap lock 90 is still pretty tight radius. You're gonna still get a decent amount of resistance in that, but that's not a bad idea. And in fact, it may be easier to make that connection with that 90 in there, get it transitioned away, and then attach your flex. And what you can do with your flex is really easy because it's gonna be the same diameter. What you do is, is cut back your insulation or cut back your inner liner so you have excess insulation make your attachment, and then pull that, that insulation over that 90. So now you're not having to wrap that 90, you're just using some excess external insulation off of the flex duct. Does that make sense? So when you start to think about some of your alternatives, your alternative options, you can come up with pretty creative ways of reducing uh, restrictions. And in terms of where the restrictions matter most, they matter most when they're closer to the system. So the closer the system, closer to the system the restriction is, whether it's return or supply, the closer to the system the turbulence is, the more impact it's going to have on total system airflow. So getting that supply plenum right, making that return duct as big as you can, using a really low static pressure drop um, filter is going to make a big difference. Those of you who have done installs recently where we're doing more and more media filters, you're looking at static pressure numbers. Have you noticed a difference in using media with with kind of putting them in different locations than what we had before with one inch filters. 
Yeah, makes a big difference. Now, again, if the one inch filter you're using is the factory hog hair filter, well then maybe not, but that's just a bad filter in the first place. And besides the fact that you get bypass around that filter. So anyway, one of our number one objectives is to reduce total system static. Now again, some people will say, well you, yeah, you could get static that's too low. There are possibly cases on supply duct where, where low air velocity could become an issue, but like ACA Manual D says, of the things to worry about, that is super low on the list. So what that means is, when we are field fabricating a duct system, think in terms of the least back pressure we can provide that system. Start with the return near the system, start with the filter, those, those areas, and then move into the supply, the main plenum, and then the trunks. It's not to say the runouts don't matter, but they don't matter nearly as much to the system as the main supply plenum and the ducts that are really close to the system. In terms of the actual delivered CFM to a particular zone, that's where the, the runouts um, matter more. But even then, what, we've, you know, what we prefer to do is, it's okay to oversize a little bit, use a balancing damper, and then just make sure you use the correct register, grill register diffuser, right? You use the correct diffuser, grill register diffuser, you deliver the right airflow, you're gonna get the right velocity coming out of that vent. Make sense? Because again, you have to throw air out of the supply, and so you have to have proper air velocity. And that's where sizing of that, of that register matters. So, that's the basics. With flex duct, make sure it's fully extended. Don't always assume that you just have to, well, in order to get it to fit, I gotta jam it around this corner. Look at your other options. Can you extend the duct? Can you move it? Can you move the system in some cases? That may be necessary in order to be able to get the duct work on the piece of equipment. Or can you use a, a uh, piece of snap lock, 90, you know, and, and if it doesn't have to be a 90, that's the nice thing about snap lock, you can adjust it to whatever angle you need. Now make sure if you are using any hard fittings in addition to flex, because you can do that, but make sure you're supporting it. Because a hard fitting has a little more weight to it, right? And it's gonna be likely to pull out of the duct. So when you're attaching that to a tab collar, you still have to make sure you seal it. You have to make sure it's really nicely mechanically fastened, and then you have to make sure that it's strapped underneath that heavier fitting, okay? Everybody, everybody with me on that? All right, next thing is strapping. Go ahead, Travis. Yeah, yeah, and Travis said sometimes the snap lock 90s will leak. When you're dealing with snap lock and not spiral, I mean, again, spiral is a whole different animal, but when you're dealing with, you know, your typical kind of inexpensive single wall snap lock that we use with those adjustable 90s, they tend to leak. So yeah, once you get them set how you want them, then go ahead and seal them. When it comes to strapping of ductwork, this is an area that we don't think enough about it. When we are doing changeouts, I don't know if you all know this, but we are required by code to inspect every existing duct system. Leakage, strapping are the two biggest things that we need to be inspecting. If you have ducts that are being supported across the ceiling joists, across the trusses, and they're kind of doing this, that's not acceptable strapping. They have to be strapped so that way there's tension on the duct. A lot of times, you know, 10 years ago, they were you know, doing explosion in the duct factory style duct systems. You just take your 25 foot of flex, you just throw it. If it's 10 feet, it's still 25 feet, right? And you see that sometimes. And in those cases, it's gonna be good to reduce the length of that duct and make it so that it's nice and, it's nice and tight. I mean, again, you don't want it banjo string tight so it's wanting to pull off the fitting, but you want it to be fully extended so that way that internal accordion is expanded and you don't get that additional turbulence because it does make a difference. You can test it sometime if you're measuring CFM, you have somebody with a hood and just take a piece of flex and just you know, put some bends in it. You'll notice that it does affect the amount of airflow that that duct uh, produces because of the back pressure that's produced. So in terms of strapping, every four feet is the standard. So four inch, I mean, every four foot centers. Whenever you are strapping flex duct, you wanna use an inch and a half wide or wider strap. And that's pretty much true of everything that we do, so that way it has more surface area. But keep in mind that the more surface area that we get, the less likely you are to collapse the duct. And so that's why it has to be done regularly, so that way you don't have any one support bearing too much weight, because that's when you get that sag. There's a lot in the, um, what is it called? The, uh, the Duct Council, Flexible Duct Council, FDC, I think is what it is. Um, they have a guide there that you can look at that's got a lot of really good specific information. 
But again, I know most of you aren't going to be thinking about the radius bend and how much is too much and all that, which is why I would much rather you just visualize it as water and think, how do I reduce the turbulence in this duct system? And especially when we're going out to do a new install, our goal is not only to put in a nice new piece of equipment, but wherever possible to improve that duct system. And these are some really low pieces of low hanging fruit. In addition to improving your return, improving your filtration, those things close to the system, look at that entire distributed duct system. In terms of sealing ducts, so you go into an existing house that has a bunch of flex and board in it, like pretty much every house has in Florida. What are you looking for when it comes to saying, all right, this needs to be sealed? What, is your, what are your visual cues? Tears. What else? Sweating, discoloration. Um, another thing that a lot of people look for is, does it have mastic on the outside? But truthfully, the whole mastic on the outside thing is really just a shortcut way that inspectors in our state have come to view duct sealing. It really isn't a standard. In fact, if you look at the flex duct councils, two ways of attaching flex duct, neither of them include mastic on the outside. Now, am I telling you not to use mastic on the outside? No, because I don't want to fail inspections, right? But mastic on the outside of the duct is not how you seal a flex duct. So I just want to get that so we're all clear on that. It's not that it's pointless because anything that helps you pass inspections is still has a point, right? But that's not what results in a flex duct leaking. Where does the flex duct leak from? Leak from? It leaks from the connection where the internal liner attaches to the collar. That's one place, and also where the collar attaches in to the duckboard. So what do we do to seal the collar to the duckboard? When you cut the hole, you paint around the hole with mastic and when you set the collar in. That does a really good job because then when you, when you tab over that collar, you get a really nice seal, that collar edge, because again, those, those tabs are providing that, that holding force for the mastic to dry. So that's a good one. The most controversial part of the process is the next part, which is that internal liner to the tab collar. How do you make that connection? Mastic. Travis says mastic. Anyone else? Grant says mastic. <laughs> you didn't say mastic. I said Grant. Grant, your name isn't Travis. You look like a Travis, though, you know? Wow. Oh, wow. That was, this is getting dark in here quick. Grant says mastic. What does Travis say? Okay, mastic and a panduit strap in the inner liner. Any other suggestions? Tape and a panduit on the inner liner. Okay, I was waiting for that one. Any other suggestions? Panduit on the inner liner. Ayo! <laughs> yeah, do the mastic first, then the tape on the wet mastic. It works great. <laughs> well, no, you get the mastic on the inner liner, you pull the inner liner over it, and then you tape the inner liner onto your collar. Mastic inside the flex. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. A lot easier that way. Okay. Instead of on the collar, inside the flex, instead of on the collar. Okay. I buy that one. Okay. Is this a way that people are doing this a lot? Because this isn't a new one for that I've. Okay. All right. Cool. That's how I do it. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Okay. So. The Flex Duct Council, again, I, I, keep, I think it's the Air Duct Council and it's the Flex Duct Guide. Maybe that's what, I think it's Air Duct Council. So they give you two alternate ways. One is to use tape on the collar with a draw band or panduit strap or large zip tie, whatever you want to call it. Panduit strap's just a brand name. They have some of them they actually show using like a giant uh, hose clamp, which seems like kind of a cool way, really. A little excessive. A little excessive maybe, but you know, okay. Yeah, ain't coming off. Um, so all of the, all the, both of their methods show the panduit. So let's just agree we're going to use the panduit. Okay, all right. So panduit on the inside, that one's good. Mastic or tape is allowable. Now the downside, of course, with mastic is that mastic has to dry. That's the downside with mastic. And if you're going to be doing a job where you're going to be running cold air through this thing really soon, that's where mastic becomes more of a problem because now you're pressurizing it, it's more likely that it's gonna blow out around the wet mastic, you're gonna get condensation. That's more of the challenge. So I am an advocate of the mastic method, especially when 
you are in a, a situation where you can allow it to dry. You know, new construction, you know, big project, come back the next day. I like that way. And ideally, when you're using mastic on the inside, again, I'm just telling you ideally, so we're talking in a perfect world here, you would have that outer liner pulled back so that way it could be allowed to air dry before you pull the outer liner over. That would be an ideal circumstance, okay? But to Kyle's point, cleaning the fittings with alcohol is really helpful if you are going to use any type of tape. In fact, it's helpful even with mastic. Because a lot of these fittings, because some of you will say, well, yeah, but if I don't get it wet, I don't sweat on it, I don't know. well, that's not really it. These fittings have an oil on them from the factory. So taking some rubbing alcohol on a rag, it'd probably be better put it in a spritz bottle. They actually sell them that way at the drugstore. You can buy isopropyl alcohol. Some people say denatured alcohol. I don't care what kind of alcohol you use, other than it's not the drinking kind, because that's not allowed to be in your truck. <laughs> okay, go ahead and try that one. Um, so you spritz it around, then just wipe it down. That will help the attachment of all types of uh, methods that you use, but especially with the tape method. Tape that is the UL181FX is specifically designed for flex. That's what the FX means. And so this stuff that you, some of you are complaining about with this, you know, butyl type of, uh, you know, a little bit more of a mastic tape type. It's not, this isn't technically a mastic tape, but it has that butyl type of um, uh, adhesive on it. Um, I think it works well, but again, I'm not gonna dictate to you specifically what tape you use for a job, so long as you're making sure that it is fully attached and you're squeegeeing it in place. So in terms of the things that I would really like to see, if you're using Grant's method where you put mastic on the inside of the flex and maybe not bringing it all the way to the edge so it doesn't you know, squeeze out on you, I think that's a really good method in addition to alcohol and tape and Panduit. That to me is beautiful. And then if you want to get even more extreme and put some, some mastic on top of that and let it dry, there you go, Bob's your uncle. But again, the point isn't to be, <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> you guys are so specific. So the point is to create a leak-free connection that's not gonna come apart, all right? That's really the point. Now the problem is, is that we're not testing every duct connection that we make. And so this is why I have a lot of respect for the process that Neil uses, which is what we put on Instagram, because he does test his duct connections and he does use a ton of flex, like a lot of flex over long runs and a lot of connections. So his method is what we showed, which is cleaning it, using, um, using tape, using mastic, using a Panduit strap, um, and on the outside of the duct where you attach it, this is where when you attach that outer liner, I don't really care how you do it, so long as the insulation is fully butted up. In an ideal world, in an ideal world, silver tape, well cleaned with alcohol, and they call it, uh, my, my old boss at Dell Air, Nevin Wurtenberger, used to call this the diaper method. I don't know why he called it this, I guess because you use a lot of tape, I'm not sure. But you just take pieces of tape, and you, and you take that entire outside and you diaper it to the duckboard. And so it's all a silver, silver on silver. It does reduce condensation, it does reduce growth, and you can ensure that you get that insulation all the way up and around. If I had my choice in my own house and inspector wasn't gonna gripe about not seeing any mastic, that would be my favorite way of attaching that outer um, that outer jacket. And the same thing is true in the villages where we can get away with not using mastic and instead we just use silver tape. Who likes that way? As long as you get tight fitment, everything is tightly fitted, do you really need a bunch of glop on it? The answer is no, you really don't. Everything has to be fit tight. It has to be nice and clean. You use a squeegee. You get nice connection, you know, nice overlap. The biggest problem that I see with a lot of the duct systems that, you know, we're where they don't do this right is they don't get enough tape overlap and they're not really squeegeeing it to a nice clean surface so it peels off and then it starts to leak. But mastic or, or duct sealant or pookie as some people call it in the West, which I forbid you from calling it pookie. That is not what it's, there actually is a brand. There is, there is actually a brand of duct sealant called pookie, which is where that comes from, I think. Uh, but it's just terrible. Anyway, the point is, is to get tight duct fitment and good seal and it's the inner of a piece of flex that you're sealing. The outer, it's about getting a solid vapor barrier. 
So can you take, here's a question for you, can you take the outside of a flex duct, pull it up to the duct board, just put a zip tie, zip strap on it, pan to it, whatever you want to call it, draw a band, and leave it? Is that good enough? Why not? Because there's a gap. So it's not so much, because again, if you seal the inner, it's not going to leak air, shouldn't, if the inner is sealed. But you, ha you don't have that continuous vapor barrier, and it's that continuous vapor barrier that prevents high dew point air from getting in there and creating condensation around that edge. So, what did I say? Correct, correct. If, you, if air can get in from that outer into the inner where it attaches, you know, where those two fit together, then it can create condensation in there, regardless of whether or not there's an air seal. You don't need an air leak to have condensation. I mean, we all know this. You could just have poor insulation, poor vapor barrier. And so we need to have insulation intact all the way to the ductboard, where the flex attaches to the ductboard. We need to have insulation intact, and we need to have that outer vapor barrier intact. Now, we're using mastic to fill in that gap, right? But mastic really isn't the ideal answer because you could have this gap that you glop mastic in, but you actually don't have the insulation pushed all the way up against. So again, in my perfect world, you wouldn't even be using a Panduit on the outside. The problem is with our method, um, without using tape, if you don't put a Panduit on the outside, you've got nothing holding that outer jacket, and while that mastic is drying, it will just pull away, right? So given our process where you don't use tape on the outer, you don't really have a choice but to use that outer panduit. But an outer panduit has a problem. And what is the problem with the outer panduit? It squeezes the insulation, correct. Which is why the Flex Duct Council does not show that as an option. When you compress insulation, it ceases to be insulation. It would be just like, oh, I'm blowing R30 in the house, and then you just go and stomp it all down because you don't like how it looks. <laughs> right? It doesn't, it doesn't work. Get it all splat, right? Right. right. You trust. You need to have air and insulation in order for it to insulate. And so when you smash down that outer insulation of flex duct, you reduce its R value. And when you do that, you can create sweating, especially in an R market where even regular old ducts just running through the attic want to sweat because of how high our dew points are. So again, I'm not the installation manager, so I'm not going to tell you the specifics of how everything has to be done. But I would rather see, I would rather see Duckboard and fittings cleaned, and that outer jacket attached to the duckboard using tape, and then in order to pass inspection, slap some mastic on it on the outside, rather than using a zip tie, panduit, draw band, whatever you want to call it, on that outer. On the inner, yes. So on the inner, use a zip tie for sure, and use mastic for sure. I would also, I think I like Grant's method best, or I think you said the same thing, Travis. You have some mastic on the inside, then put it, pull it over, zip tie, or first, first tape. I would still like to see you use tape, and then a zip tie, and then your outer taped, and then sealed, just so that way the inspectors don't gripe at you. They don't require any villages. Some counties don't require it. The villages, do, in fact, the villages doesn't want to see it, they right? Tape, yeah, they tape it. All right. Which is weird. But again, it's not weird because it get, they're going off of what the manufacturer's specifications say.